Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, the next talk is going to be the net neutrality debate, a supply demand perspective by Dr. V. Sridhar. Uh, Dr. Sridhar is a research fellow at Saskan Communication Technologies in Bangalore, uh, where he is responsible for R&D, uh, knowledge management, and overall strategic initiatives of Saskan. Uh, his primary research interests are in telecommunication management and policy, so this talk is very well in his area of expertise. Uh, he is a recipient of no uh, Nokia Visiting Fellowship Award uh, from Nokia Research Foundation. Uh, he has authored many books and uh, research articles. Uh, Dr. Sridhar uh, has a PhD from University of Iowa and has taught at many institutions in USA, New Zealand, India, including I am Lucknow, I am Bangalore, and Management Development Institute, Gurgaon. Over to you, Dr. Sridhar. Thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Venkateswaran and to Persistent uh, for inviting me over here for this particular topic. So in fact, uh, Venki asked me uh, to talk about net neutrality. It's a debate, so I have to take either or position, th this side or that side. Uh, then uh, Venki said that, you know, you need not take a particular side. You can actually uh, be on both sides. So that's probably uh, the way in which I will go through uh, my presentation and talk here today. Uh, but it has inherent interest uh, because uh, uh, the book that I wrote last year has become almost outdated. So a lot of things to add. So net neutrality is one of the chapters that uh, will probably be added in the talks for the University Press. Uh, so we'll follow the same format. Uh, so I have some four sequence uh, laid out. So at the end of each sequence, uh, we can pass uh, for question answers and, and we can do the same thing as uh, what uh, Venki did earlier. Uh, so nice to be here, and we'll start this. <clears throat> uh, so what I want to, uh, you know, basically Venki laid out uh, the uh, foundations of my talk. So how is it going to be different from what uh, um, you have heard the last one and a half years, uh, one and a half hours? So there are three things which are going to be different. I'll be talking more about mobile, wireless, uh, not talking about wired infrastructure. I'll be more uh, talking about access networks and not core networks. And uh, the uh, third uh, aspect is going to be <clears throat> more on techno-economics of net neutrality, not just the technology aspect of it, because there's always money involved when you talk about operators. I hope no operators here. So net neutrality is more, more aligned with the operators, and therefore, uh, it's the economics aspect uh, that will also be covered during my talk. Um, so what I thought was, why don't we look at uh, this particular net neutrality on its isolation, but look at it in a context. The context is the supply demand. So there is some supply of networks, there is some demand for networks. So the net neutrality comes in between, and how do we solve this net neutrality problem is the way in which I'm going to approach this. Yeah. So. Um, Going back to Turing Award winner Winton Cerf, um, this is what he said about uh, quotes on net neutrality. I'll just pass for you to have a look at it. Allowing broadband carriers to control what people see and do online would fundamentally undermine the principles that have made the internet such a success. So we've heard about the success of the internet, uh, but there are some problems associated with the internet. Uh, but uh, today, control over the internet is not something which the internet protagonists would want to do. A number of justifications have been created to support carrier control over consumer choices online and stand up to scrutiny. So this is exactly the way in which the internet geeks would look at it and then say that. Um, there is also Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the uh, World Wide Web. He is also obviously not for uh, any control over the internet. So he says that neutral communications medium is essential to a society base of fair competitive market economy, the base of democracy by which a community should decide what to do. It's the basis of science by which humankind should decide what is true. Let us protect the neutrality of the net. So both quotes are for net neutrality. So there's a strong uh, arguments for net neutrality. But of course, the other side is that there are also opponents to net neutrality. And we'll go through some examples and then see why the opponents uh, say why they don't want uh, net neutrality. And then we'll go through some examples. So in general, the content of this particular talk is going to be along these lines. So first, we'll discuss about the demand for multimedia. So demand for network capacity. So we'll see uh, some examples, uh, some forecasts, and things like that. Then, of course, I'll touch a little bit on the internet technology that Venki addressed earlier. 
about the stupid, stupidity of the network and the intelligence the edges. Then uh, we'll talk a little bit about supply of network capacity, wireline versus wire, wireless. So wireless is mobile is becoming ubiquitous and therefore that's the way in which most of the uh, network uh, services will be accessed. So we'll go a little bit in detail about the supply of this particular network capacity and uh, I'll also introduce the concept uh, of uh, how it is um, important in the Indian context. India, of course, having touched one billion uh, mobile users going to be witnessing net neutrality. Nobody is talking about net neutrality as of now, but it's going to become more and more important. Uh, then uh, we'll discuss some of the economics of net neutrality, including the problem of the commons. And then we'll uh, discuss about the debate, pro what proponents say, what opponents say, and so on. Uh, specifically with respect to the Indian context, we'll draw some examples. And then finally, the regulatory and policy implications. All these things rest on how the policies are made, how it is enforced, how it is implemented, and so on. Most of the countries are still struggling with to take either this side or that side. So we'll go through some examples and then see how it is relevant in the Indian context. Right? So it will be techno-economic regulation. That's the way in which I will approach this particular problem. And then we'll go through uh, if uh, you have any uh, questions. So first we'll look at the demand side. So what are the factors that drive demand uh, for network capacity? So these are some examples from Cisco's well-researched uh, 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 report which came out in 2011 about mobile uh, data traffic growth. So there are some new terms which are coined exabytes and things like that. I for normally forget the exponent, it's 14 or 18 and things like that. So but in general, you're talking about big numbers, right? about uh, 6.3 exabytes of data is going to be uh, transported through the network per month. And that's the mobile data that's going to be transported over the month. So it is huge and you can see that this particular curve is becoming exponential over a period of time, right? So when it is exponential, you don't see basically the saturation, where the saturation is going to be. Uh, most of the technical adoptions, as you're probably are aware, are yes curve based, right? Goes like yes and then it attains saturation at some point but it still seems to be in the exponential phase. Uh, the second one is device diversification. We have seen uh, the use of more and more smartphones, tablets. Today you must have uh, seen in the newspaper this week, a lot of things happened. For example, the Lumion smartphone was released by Nokia. Um, uh, today, uh, Kindle uh, received, uh, released that HD tablet, which, is, which may be, uh, you know, for example, a precursor uh, as an opponent to uh, iPhone 5, which is going to be launched on September 12th. So a lot of smartphones are being introduced into the market, and you can do a lot of things apart from calling. Of course, people do call, but you can do a lot more things with smartphones and tablets and so on. So the traditional laptop and desktop oriented network access is slowly moving towards smartphone tablet based access. And these are mobile devices, right? So which means that most of the demand in future for data data meaning bits and bytes, are going to be happening from mobile devices. Uh, this, the third one uh, is, uh, you know, how are these uh, traffic segmentation take place? Um, if you see most of the traffic uh, which we see in the future is emanating from uh, the smartphones and tablets are going to be video traffic. So as you know, BitTorrent and things like that consume a lot of bandwidth. And these are the traffic which are transported over the mobile networks uh, as we see it today, and it will continue to happen in the future. So if you look at uh, the bottom ones which are circled, uh, most of the mobile traffic is going to be on web browsing and online video, so which are going to consume a lot of bandwidth. So there is, we expect, these are all global traffic demands. We cannot say that it may be the same across individual countries, but in general, if you look at, uh, the, uh, the behavior of the people who use smartphones, laptops, and, and things like that, you can uh, project this for each and every country. It may not be at the same scale, uh, but it might vary you know, in terms of scale across the different countries. But in general, there's going to be a more and more demand for data, and this data is going to be consuming a lot of con network bandwidth, and that's going to be the future. In fact, uh, in one of the studies that I did, uh, Earlier, the mobile only internet population will grow 56 fold uh, from 14 million to about 788 million. What it says is that people who are accessing internet, they are accessing it only through mobile devices. The mobile devices meaning smartphones, tablets, 
right? They are not going to be connected to the desktop, just connected to a DSL line or something like that to access the internet. So most of it is going to be on the go. Uh, even if you, I mean, I have looked at the temporal variation of traffic throughout the 24 hours of the day. If you look at the temporal uh, variation, most of the traffic seems to be taking place, at least globally, when people are on the move, right? So when, pe when people are on the, you know, uh, traveling, commuting, uh, workplace, 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning, that's when a lot of data gets pushed onto the network. A lot of people are accessing data, either for uh, enterprise services or, uh, you know, entertainment or whatever it is. And also, uh, this uh, temporal variation is very interesting. A uh, lot of data uh, traffic peaks happen after night, you know, 12 o'clock uh, to 4 o'clock is the peak period in which the online traffic seems to shoot up. Right? So, uh, in general, it has a characteristic which is very different from the Erlang-based calculations that we used to make for voice. And therefore, um, this is the truth of the future, and therefore we need to somehow deal with it. Um, now, you can say that, no, India, it doesn't happen. In, in fact, the smartphone uh, adoption in, in, in India, if you plot it, it's also increasing exponentially. The number of smartphones are getting sold are increasing day by day on an exponential basis. And uh, I was talking to one of the operators, they said that my uh, 3G network is, you know, 10% loaded. It's not loaded, nobody is opting for 3G. Next month he says that my network is 50% loaded. And that's the improvement in the data traffic that we are seeing in India on 3G, right? I mean, it is quite possible that because of the difference in strategies and the way in which they priced it, 3G did not take off until now, but today, with the availability of smartphones and desktops, the 3G traffic is increasing. Soon the operators will find out that the bare minimum of five megahertz which the government doled out <laughs> in the 3G auction for which they are stupid enough to pay 16,000 crores per pan-India basis is going to become congested. Right? Five megahertz is the bare minimum requirement for WCD main. And you will soon get congested with the traffic that is emanating from the mobile devices. In fact, this is a recent study by Nokia Siemens which says that India loves mobile broadband. I mean, it says that uh, mobile data traffic is increasing and it is very much, uh, you know, commensurate with what the operators are saying. Operators are witnessing 50 to 60 percent loading today compared to, for example, 10 percent loading on the network about two months back. Uh, in fact, category B and C circles in India, which, which are not, you know, which are like Bihar, Assam, Odisha, uh, Northeast, all those places, are seeing extra traffic. I mean, the reason may be that, we'll come to that later on, there's no other alternative except to use mobile in order to access the internet, right? So the first time mobile users are very high in India. We have just touched about one billion, discount all this dual SIMs and things like that. Still we'll have about 600 to 700 mobile users which are registered on the home location, I mean, visiting location registered. So even if you take about 600, and if you take a percentage of that, who are having smartphones, it is still a huge number. I always give this talk when I go to Finland. You know, Finland has 5 million, 6 million population. We are adding 5 million, 6 million every month, right? So that's the sheer number which <laughs> basically increases the amount of data traffic on the uh, network. So, um, um, the, 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 you know, the operators may be uh, thinking that, uh, you know, by reducing the traffic, we are going to solve this problem of network loading, but soon they will find out that it's going to get congested. So uh, even in India, the, the, the trend globally that we see in terms of mobile data traffic is, going, is, uh, is, ap is applicable. So we come back to what uh, Venki said earlier. So in general, the telecom operator's viewpoint is that I am the telecom operator. I, will, I have a very intelligent network. So you don't have to have intelligent terminals. So you have to have some dumb terminals. You make a call and we'll provide all these services for you. That's the view of the operators, right? So even if you take intelligent services such as, for example, three-way calling or third-party calling and think co conferencing, you have to call and then find out whether you can do it or not, right? And the operator will give you provisioning arrangements so that you can do it. Even for, for example, caller ID, right? Caller ID, today it is available ubiquitously, but as you know, in even three or four years back, you have to call the operator to say that I want the caller ID and they'll give you caller ID. So it is all given by the operator. Because the operator is a bottleneck operator, right? Operator is the entity, right, through which you can reach the network. You cannot reach it otherwise, right? So this is a bottleneck. In general, the operators, that is who provide the access, 
are always considered as natural monopoly, at least in fixed land. Right? That is the reason why even until 1996 in the US, which liberalized telecom in the 70s and 80s, you could still go to only one operator to get the basic fixed line service because it was considered as a natural monopoly. Right? So the natural monopoly, what it means is that you, it is optimal to have only one operator to provide access service. Why? Because duplication is not warranted and it is not economical also. Even if you have two lines coming to your house, you will ultimately end up using only one line and therefore the other line has become redundant. Right? So the natural, the at and always believe that natural monopoly is the way to go for access service. Right? So until you know in the, in the US when 100 percent, almost nearly 99.5 percent of the households had fixed line said that there is no more uh, you know essential to have natural monopoly. Right? You need to introduce some kind of competition so that innovation can happen, prices can come down and things like that. In fact, in India, we were very forward, right? We introduced competition basic line service, you know when? 1992, even before the US. Because our fix, uh, fixed line operator, which is the Department of Telecom, was not able to provide the service and therefore we thought that we'll break the, break this natural monopoly so that private operators could come and then enter and provide the service. But it has been a failure, as you know, right? Because in fixed line service, uh, there are about 46 million lines in India and uh, close to 37 to 38 million are owned by the government operators like BSNL and MTNL. The rest only 6 to 7 million are owned by all the private operators put together pan India, right? Which means that the concept of natural monopoly may still hold good in the case of fixed line. But the mobile is not, is very different, right? Mobile we see 12 to 14 operators, there's enough competition. In fact, India is one of the most competitive of all the telecom industries in the world. So, so in the general philosophy of the operators is that I have an intelligent network, you just call me and then we can provide you with all the provisioning of the services. Uh, on the other hand, as Venki pointed out, internet uses this intelligence on the edges, right? So I have a network, but you can pump in whatever you want, data, email, voice over IP, video, uh, I can just manage it because it's all just bits and bytes and therefore we can send it across from one, one source to a destination as long as I know the destination, right? So uh, the control, the control, the internet geeks or uh, uh, you said uh, uh, netheads, yeah, you have netheads. Netheads believe that the, the control should be with the user, right? I as a user should be able to create application and then uh, send it from one uh, place to the other and things like that. Um, and um, uh, the philosophy of the internet is again goes back is that it is cheap uh, and so we don't provide, you know, we provide best effort and you can continue to uh, um, operate on your, uh, on your whims and fancies. Unleash innovation at the edges. So what we are providing you is a damn network, and therefore you can create whatever applications you want, right? So if you go to uh, Apple i Store or Google Android Marketplace, you can see thousands and thousands, millions, right? Today, I think Android Marketplace has clocked over 500,000 uh, applications. So you have so many applications. Most of it uses internet or in some form or the other, internet or a packet switch network. Uh, so the intelligence at the edges allow the content creators and application providers you know, uh, to create applications, novel applications, which can use the network as it is. So power moves from the infrastructure to innovation at the edges. Right? So the important thing is the operator owns the infrastructure. He wants to have control. Whereas what internet net norm, uh, 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 geeks are saying is that the network it cannot be controlled, let it be free, and then let the applications prosper. Right? So that's the view of the uh, internet uh, uh, proponents. An important thing, as uh, Vinke also pointed out, is that the beautiful thing about the internet is that the TCP IP protocol is network independent. Right? So it operates in the network layer, therefore you can use satellite network, mobile network, uh, or fixed line network, any kind of network at the physical layer as well as the data, data link layer level in order to transport internet packets. Therefore, it is not required to modify the network in any way, right? So depending on the kind of access that you have, you will still be able to run applications over the internet. So that's the beauty of the internet. Now the question is, so there is demand, so the demand is more from the mobile devices today and this demand is continuing to increase exponentially with very high uh, you know, adoption rate. Uh, the network 
On the other hand, the network operators are seeing this demand, but they don't want to lose control, right? Uh, on, the, on the other hand, the internet can be accessed only through the operator's network. That's the most important thing. So unless you have operator's network, you cannot really connect to the network, right? So the operators want to have control on this bottleneck operation, right? So that's the crux of the problem. So I'll stop here. If you have any questions, we can take it on the demand side. So demand, where the demand is and how the demand is going to grow in the future with respect to applications, services, data, and so on. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, please. Would the, uh, I think what am I thinking is maybe that if the copyright thing comes into the picture, would the demand come down? Because if you look at the downloads and the storage and all those things there, Correct. it's mostly non uh, copyright kind of violence. Need the copyright regulation. Correct. Okay. So I, I'll answer it afterwards because it's very much related to what is called as two-sided markets. I'll come to that. But in general, the peer-to-peer -peer traffic, if, for example, uh, there is a stringent IP uh, you know, copyright regulation, it's quite possible that the peer-to-peer -peer traffic might reduce, right? But uh, I will come to the other side. The operators or the content providers themselves can provide copyright content, and that will drive the demand for bandwidth. I'll come to that and discuss about the two-sided market later on. But your point about peer-to-peer -peer traffic Reducing because of copyrights might, I mean, it could, it could happen, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, can you tell me, uh, uh, right now we are having an uh, operator as a bottleneck, right? Correct. Yeah, why don't we have network itself as a bottleneck and I, uh, the uh, subscriber will be able to choose the operator. I mean to say, for example, voice, uh, I, will, I will choose for at and for uh, data, I will choose for uh, sprint and uh, rest of the... Absolutely. So, that is good. Uh, the only thing is, uh, how are the uh, devices, I mean, are the devices very intelligent enough to choose the operator as they want, okay? That's the question. You know, suppose, for example, I have a device and then I put a SIM. That SIM locks the who the operator is because the operator operates on a particular frequency which has been given. And therefore, I cannot really move to another operator because this particular SIM is locked to that particular operator's frequency and the operator's network. But in that case, what we can have a centralized SIM, for example, I will have a BSNL as a, uh, as if uh, talking, uh, we are talking in India, I will have a BSNL network and now BSNL will route uh, to, uh, for, for example, subscriber as uh, subscribe to uh, Airtel for voice calls, then I will. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. So that is supply side. I'll come to that, right? So this is about managing how my network supply is going to be, okay? So for example, I am running out of capacity. So is it possible that I can borrow capacity from someone else and route it? Okay, that's the supply side. I'll come to that. I'll come and discuss it. Any other questions? Yes. So adding to his point, let's say you have a dual SIM uh, port. Right. So will you be able to, your application be able to decide for a particular type of... Absolutely. So uh, Venki mentioned about cognitive radio. It's also related to supply side. I'll come to that supply side, okay? So it is related to cognition. I mean, why do people have dual SIMs? I mean, they have cognition in their minds, right? So they can switch the network depending upon what is available, coverage, uh, rates, and things like that. So uh, I, that is again related to the supply side, okay? That is how the network should make available uh, enough supply of network capacity so that this demand can be met. I will also address that. Any other questions? Okay. So then we can move on. Uh, so supply side. Supply side is the capacity of the network. Okay. So we talked about demand. So there's going to be demand and things like that. But uh, what are the uh, you know, problems on the supply side, on the network side? This is uh, we discussed, right? So this is the uh, characteristics of uh, wireline and wireless. So worldwide, if you see, the uh, Mobile broadband is increasing exponentially, whereas fixed narrowband is decreasing, and then uh, even fixed broadband marginally increases worldwide. And if you look at the right hand, it is characteristic of India. Okay? The mobile subscriber base continues to go exponentially. I am still not at a doubt as to why, when it when it will come saturation, because we have only 1.3 billion people. We have already <laughs> supplied about 1 million connections. So will it reach, you know, saturation? But the important thing is teledensity in cities like Delhi and Mumbai and Calcutta is about 220, right? So teledensity need not be 100. That is 100 phones per 100 people, 100 population. It can be 300 for 100 population. <laughs> so uh, in fact, subscriber base is the most transparent things in our country, right? Because only by quoting the subscriber numbers that the operators can ask for spectrum. <laughs> and therefore, spectrum is a scarce resource and it's very essential that uh, 
something is kept very transparent and that is subscriber base. But if you look at it, it is continues to go exponentially, right. So maybe because of dual SAM and things like that. The second one is look at the fixed line, fixed line penetration that is uh, this one continues to decrease, right. Nobody expected this some time back, but today if you see people are surrendering landlines and they are replacing it with mobile in India, right. So for example, MTNL has lost many number of subscribers. The reason is that fixed line has lost its relevance, right. Why do you want a fixed line? If you want to make a call, you can always make a call from the mobile, right. And mobile is a personal device and therefore everybody in my home can have one mobile, whereas landline is a household thing, only one landline that I can have on my in my house. Uh, I want to do broadband, yes, there is some case for fixed line, uh, but still uh, you know the broad line, the, the DSL penetration in India is very low. So the mobile operators have to provide mobile broadband since the demand, since they see the demand. So in future it is expected that most of the broadband access will be through mobile. Uh, so the point here is that fixed line has lost its relevance. We do not have to talk about fixed line at all, especially in the case of emerging countries like India. So you only talk about mobile, right. So in the case of mobile, what are the problems? There are a lot of problems, right. First we will let us talk about positives of the mobile, uh, mobile industry. The mobile industry has been growing phenomenally. I mean you see a lot of technologies, 2G, 3G, 2G scam in between 3G and then 4G and so on, right. So maybe 3G scam sometime it will come. So but in general you see all these numbers keep on increasing, right. And if you see the technology, the uh, in terms of uh, megabits per second, it is also increasing. We are almost increasing 1 gigabit per second on the access side, right, which used to be only the core network, but today we can actually reach 1 gigabit per second. So uh, the technology such as for example, all of you might be using this Tata Photon Plus card and things like that, which operates at uh, you know good 3 Mbps, right. So that is the 3G CDMA video, then you have uh, Airtel which has launched its TDLT uh, network uh, in Bangalore and Calcutta, I mean it is said that there are about 3000 subscribers who have subscribed to TDLT network using their dongles, which operates at close to uh, even 100 megabits per second on the access side. So there are these new technologies which increase the amount of bits that you can push through a given bandwidth, right. So the famous Shon Shannon's law is being broken, right, Shannon's law which basically says that uh, you know the amount of bits that you can uh, put it through. Uh, depends upon the capacity uh, in terms of channel bandwidth and the signal to noise ratio. So how can we increase for example the throughput, we can increase the throughput using a lot of multiplexing schemes, right. So the kind of uh, multiplexing and the multiple access schemes that are used in today's 3G and 4G networks phenomenally have increased the speed of access, right. So there are these technologies being put into place. We have leapfrogged, right, I must say that we have leapfrogged, I mean we missed 1G, we directly went into 2G, digital cellular system and then we are on par with the rest of the world in terms of deploying 4G, which is the LTE networks which are being deployed uh, in India. So uh, the operators on their part, you, know, you don't, you should not blame the operators all the time, the operators are also doing their part in order to improve the technology of access. Uh, this is a snapshot from the GSA associations worldwide. But uh, I'll, I'll show you, um, uh, you know, most of the uh, things are happening uh, here in India as well. Uh, all the networks are being upgraded to, uh, you know, for example, the WCDMA 3G network, the 3.5G, which is HSPA network, HSPA plus network, and things like that, right, uh, and LTE. So if you look at it, LTE is the fastest developing mobile uh, technology ever. It's being adopted left and right by all the operators in the US and Europe, and in India, it is, it will be adopted soon, it is being adopted already, right. So the long term evolution network which is capable of providing high throughput for a given amount of capacity uh, or the frequency is uh, uh, being deployed. So you have the whole ecosystem available, you do, you do not have to invent from scratch, right. So you have this technology, it is standardized, you have network equipment providers uh, who, who can provide this particular network uh, as boxes and therefore the operators can plug it in their network. Uh, they have the frequency which has been aligned, of course they paid a huge amount, but they have the frequency and therefore they can operate the network uh, using these technologies. So on the supply side, they are, we see traction in terms of deployment of high capacity networks uh, by the mobile operators. Uh, so uh, general uh, 338 operators are investing in LTE and LTE is the fastest uh, developing mobile systems uh, technology ever. We have also seen the, the, the you know, the, the uh, net heads are not lagging behind, right. 
these are all about bell heads, right? The operators who have invested in this technology, there is associations called ITU, 3GPP and things like that, which have promoted these particular technologies from the operator side. On the other hand, the net heads are also looking at improving their speed, right? They are not satisfied with providing just 100 Mbps over the Wi-Fi network, right? So a lot of new uh, open networks that uh, Wi-Fi uh, has, uh, uh, has proven to the world uh, is happening. So you see here, uh, the IEEE 802.11n is being deployed. n is capable of going up to, uh, for example, 150 megabits per second. But there is also one more uh, standard called AC, which is a giga Wi-Fi, which can give a throughput of gigabit per second in the Wi-Fi access network, right? So which means that you have a, a tablet or you have a laptop uh, which has a Wi-Fi modem, then you don't have to really worry about operator's network as long as you can find a nearby Wi-Fi hotspot. So you can start using that network. Capacity is sufficient, extremely sufficient for you to run any kind of application, right? So the net heads are also looking at these technologies in order to put it in the local areas. So which means that in general, the capacity of the network has also been increasing exponentially in tune with the demand. Now where is the problem? <laughs> you can ask that, right? So then where the problem is solved, right? Because the demand is increasing exponentially. I am also increasing the uh, capacity uh, exponentially in tune with the demand, and therefore there should not be any problem. However, there are problems. The problem is that in the case of mobile networks, we use what is known as spectrum. <laughs> which is the, uh, the controversy and you can see it in the newspaper every day, right? So spectrum is a scarce resource. Right? It's not available in plenty. So it is available only in certain fixed quantities. And therefore, if you have the mobile operator who wants to provide the service, I need to allocate it, right? When I allocate it, I can use a lot of rules, right? So for example, in most of the countries, they'll say that an operator has to provide good quality of service on their mobile device. And therefore, I will allocate, you know, 20 megahertz, 40 megahertz. I'll somehow make sure that there's about 100 megahertz available. I'll give 25 each to about four operators, right? That's one way to operate it. The second thing could be that, okay, I'm not able to really get the spectrum for some reason, right? It's held by defense, it's held by railways, and so on and so on. And therefore, I got only about 25, but I want to have competition because competition is good for the consumer. So I'll introduce about six to seven operators, each getting about four megahertz each. So it is possible that you can use any of these options. In one option, the operator gets enough frequency or spectrum through which he can deploy the mobile network. On the other hand, the operator gets a very small chunk in which he has to apply, deploy the mobile network. But in general, the problem of spectrum is not specific to a particular country. It's worldwide. You know, for example, if you look at this particular chart, there's a US frequency chart from three uh, megahertz all the way to three, uh, you know, 300 gigahertz so much of spectrum available, but I'm not able to really point out here, some a bit of a portion here is only available from 450 megahertz all the way up to two gigahertz. Only that portion is available for commercial mobile services, right? Because all the others have been allocated for navigation, maritime, aeronautics, and things like that. So still every country will have only a certain amount of frequency which is allocated for commercial mobile services. Now, this is a very uh, interesting chart. Uh, this just compares, you know, two countries on the extremes. One is India, the other one is Finland, which mastered the deployment of any mobile network in the world. They are the first ones to deploy 2G, the first ones to deploy 3G, first ones to experiment with 4G, right? The Nordic countries, they are good in uh, mobile services. If you look at it, the average spectrum allocation per service area in India is roughly one third of an international average. It's very poor compared to some of the Nordic countries, such as Finland, right? So each and every operator in India gets about seven, he got about seven megahertz for uh, uh, 2G, a bare minimum five megahertz for 3G, and of course, this, what is known as broadband wireless access got a good leeway. I mean, they were able to get 20 megahertz. But in other words, if you look at it, the international average of frequency allocation in India is about two into seven megahertz, whereas the international average is about 15 megahertz. In case of 3G, it's about five megahertz, whereas in uh, the rest of the world, it's about 20 megahertz. So our operators are getting about one third to one fourth of the frequency allocated compared to, for example, the counterparts in other countries. So spectrum is scarce. For whatever reasons it may be, spectrum is still scarce, right? So you might have a wonderful technology like 4G, which operates about 
150, 200 megabits per second. But you need to have frequency, you need to have spectrum in order to deploy this particular technology and the spectrum is a constraint, right? So mobile operators might say that, you know, there are a lot of these technologies but I cannot deploy it because I don't have enough spectrum. So you, with the spectrum that I have, I can only pump so much of data through my network. The second one is broadband. So what is broadband policy? Broadband policy in, sorry, broadband policy in most of the countries, broadband policy in most of the countries you look at it, it's about provisioning of 100 Mbps. You must have recently read that. Tomorrow is the, is the last day for, I mean, if you have any home in Kansas City, <laughs> right? Kansas, you better go to Google site and then uh, sign up for Google uh, Fiber Connect, okay? So they are planning to provide gigabit per second free. So we are talking about gigabit per second in, in some of the countries, whereas we are still talking about today, the, uh, the broadband speed is about 512 um, kilobits per second and we plan to reach one megabits per second sometime in the future. That's in the policy, that's the vision for us, right? It is not in <laughs> kilobits, it's not in gigabits, it's all about, you know, a couple of megabits per second. But even that couple of megabits is very difficult to give by the operators because they don't have the scarce resource called spectrum, right? In some of the areas they may be able to give, some of the areas they may not be able to give. So, even though we have made a lot of strides in terms of regulation, uh, still we have our own conditions, right? Our own um, uh, natural country specific conditions which, uh, which affect that. What about backhaul, right? I didn't talk about backhaul at all. I think Venki talked a lot, a lot about core networks which have, you know, all these sophisticated uh, routing algorithms uh, which, uh, which, have, which are fiber linked, OC12, OC48, OC132 connections um, running at gigabit per second. What about backhaul in countries like India, right? We have gigabits running under the ocean to come to our ports, right? There's an international bandwidth available in India is very high thanks to, uh, you know, transatlantic cables such as CVMA4, you must have heard about it, Southeast Asia, Western Africa, Middle East, and, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the cable which is run by Bath Airtel from, from Chennai to Singapore running at 8.4 terabits per second. So a lot of cable coming from across other countries into our ports, right? And then there's bottleneck. From the port to the individual uh, you know, uh, uh, um, heads, in individual uh, locations, national bandwidth is pathetically low, right? So even though we have, we have had a lot of uh, policies to promote uh, infrastructure buildup on the national backbone, still national backbone is congested to some extent. So access is definitely a problem, but even if you overcome the access problem, there is still going to be a bottleneck problem until it reaches the international gateway. Right? So, uh, bandwidth is going to be a perennial problem in uh, countries like India. <clears throat> so, that's about the supply side. Any questions on the supply side? Okay. So, I, I will answer one of the questions. Suppose, for example, uh, I have, so you say that I have only limited spectrum, the operator only has limited spectrum. Is it possible that the operator can share the spectrum or the capacity, I mean associated with that is capacity, uh, with the other operators, right? This requires sharing of the spectrum. In India, the policy is such that the spectrum sharing is still not allowed, even though <laughs> you've seen operators using it, right? For example, if you're in a state like Maharashtra, right? If you go to, you might have an idea, idea of phone, but if you go into suddenly into rural area, your <laughs> logo will change from idea to Airtel, right? So what it means is that idea does not have network infrastructure, but it uses Airtel infrastructure in order to enable you to roam. That's called as intracircle roaming, which the operators did it, and after that we legalized it. Normally we do this, what is called as ex post regulation, right? Normally countries do ex ante regulation. It says that I do all these things, I have a regulation, you have to adhere according to that. India we see, uh, okay, this is the way in which market does, so we let us make it as regulation. So that's what, <laughs> that's what most of the time, in fact my book talks about uh, quite a bit of this ex post. Uh, so the 3G roaming pact, it's also there in the, in the, in the court now, is an excellent example. An operator who does not have 3G spectrum, provides 3G SIM and then provides 3G services. How? Because he shares it with the other operator, right? So uh, spectrum sharing, even, even though it is not legalized, it still happens, but uh, uh, so that is one way by which the operators can actually move the traffic from their congested network to non-congested network. If there is no coverage, they can move it to a network which has coverage, right? That's good for the country and I really am a strong uh, proponent of secondary market. Yeah. Uh, one spectrum uh, in India uh, more scarce than yes.
spectrum in India more scarce than other countries. It's not like, uh, you know, say, different amounts of spectrum are available in different countries. Yeah. So uh, the reason is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, thanks to defense, that uh, most of the Russian equipments that they have bought in 60s and 70s and things like that still operate in the 1800, 1900, 2100, which are reserved for commercial mobile services. Most of the governments have migrated all this equipment to other banks. We did not do that. Okay. Of course, uh, the policy states that these uh, have to be moved to other, you know, they have to be given an alternative way of communication. So, for example, in Delhi, MTNL has rolled out a pure optic fiber network connecting all the defense establishments. Therefore, the defense is not using any of the spectrum in the 1800 megahertz. They have released it. Okay. But replicate the same, because Delhi is a very enclosed area, you can do all those things. Optic fiber network, you can do it. And in fact, uh, there is something called as Universal Service Obligation Fund. Each and every operator pays huge amount. There's about 18,000 crores, which is lying with the government, supposed to fund this particular alternative infrastructure for defense. It's happening, but it's happening at a very low price. Therefore, the amount of spectrum which is leased to commercial mobile services by the defense is very low. Yeah. Uh, I remember reading somewhere about uh, what is called as white space, uh, uh, white space Wi-Fi or uh, white space network. Uh, I don't know the technicality of it, but uh, no, I'll come to India that. Never, India never used the whole UHF spectrum, which is around 500 Absolutely. megahertz. Absolutely. Uh, because we never had the UHF channels. We directly went to the satellite uh, TV. We didn't have the over air like US, you know? Correct. So is that frequency or is it too low for any no, of these? Uh, your point is very valid. In fact, uh, we have a new document called National Telecom Policy, which talks about 700 megahertz. Not the 450 megahertz, but 700 megahertz. 686 to 806. Uh, that is actually uh, used by terrestrial television broadcasting. Uh, and uh, it is in fact mandated in, uh, it was mandated in Europe, I mean US uh, last year, I think July of 2011, uh, to close all the analog uh, transmission over the air and then move to digital transmission so that the digital transmission is compressed, you can use less bandwidth and therefore the uh, extra spectrum can be, it's normally known as digital dividend spectrum that's used for commercial mobile services. Uh, Europe has a deadline of 2015, most of the countries like Finland, all the countries have already migrated. In India, we'll allocate the space in 2014. Huh. So the important, uh, no, the important thing is, Doordarshan was the only one which is using it, right? So uh, thanks to, for example, cable TV penetration and the DTH, which operates in the KU band, 12 to 14 gigahertz band, there is absolutely no need for us to have any kind of terrestrial uh, television network which operates in the 700 megahertz. India is in fact better positioned than any other country in the world to release that digital dividend spectrum, but it has just now dawned on the government and the NTP 2012 says that, okay. Uh, that is one thing. So we'll get good amount of spectrum. In fact, uh, it's expected that about 60 to 70 megahertz will be available in the 700 megahertz band, which will increase the amount of available spectrum for commercial mobile services. So what will happen is that 700 megahertz is like gold, right? Because it has less frequency, propagate through larger areas, and therefore, the operators can put one base station cover about 40 kilometers instead of putting one, <laughs> one base station and cover like 10 meters, 100 meters, right? For example, the inter-site distance between two BTS is one of the lowest in the world in Kanat Place. It's about 100 meters. You can see Airtel Tower from this tower to that tower, right? <laughs> because of reuse. So, in fact, in 700 megahertz, you can say optimal, but it's quite possible that depending upon the method of allocation, the price also will be like gold price. Uh, but anyway, so one more thing is that you have digital dividend. So even after allocating, it is possible that uh, you might have some spaces in between the adjacent television channels. So you will flip through one to 100 channels, right? So when you move from one to two, it goes to a different frequency. So in between, not about cable, I'm talking about terrestrial uh, uh, television broadcasting. So you, you will have some spaces in between. These spaces are not used, but it is given to the tele broadcaster to provide God band so that one channel will not interfere with the other. FCC just now mandated that this white spaces can be used for commercial mobile. And so what the operators have started doing is that they put what is known as super Wi-Fi. So what it does is, it doesn't use this traditional ISM band, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz band. It uses that space in between the 700 megahertz band to provide super Wi-Fi. So there is one tower which is selected by the operator which scans this particular white space and then whenever it is available, it will allocate it for commercial mobile and you can have one tower which can, you know, cover about 40 kilometers radius. So US uh, FCC has just now allowed it. Uh, and in the uh, national telecom policy of 2012, it is mentioned. 
it's mentioned that white spaces also can be used for increasing the availability of spectrum for commercial mobile services. But uh, digital dividend will definitely come, but there is a roadmap, and uh, of course, the government wants to earn money by auctioning the spectrum. So it will happen in 2014. <laughs> Any other questions on this uh, uh, supply side? Oh, somebody asked about uh, Wi Fi, or there was one question about ah, cognitive radio. Yeah. So it is possible that uh, one operator, so my, uh, so why people use dual SIMs? So dual SIM. Uh, one reason may be that they want to use rate plans, rate, rate plans of different operators, right? And also they can cut down the roaming cost because uh, they go from one pers one, one service area to the other. Uh, you have, if you have two, two, two SIMs, then you can uh, actually need not roam. And the third one is if the coverage is not there, right? For example, some of the new networks may not have coverage in the place you were, then you can just switch on to the other network. So cognition is in the mind of the users. We may not have, I'd like, I don't have a dual SIM. I always ask this, right? You have dual SIM or multi SIM, we don't have. But you go outside and ask a plumber or any other guy, he'll definitely have a dual SIM or multi SIM, right? In fact, every other phone which is sold uh, in the country today is a dual SIM. Nokia invented dual SIM 15 years back. It was not successful in Europe, but it's been hugely successful in India, right? If you say Nokia was the fastest selling phone, it's a dual SIM phone, right? So, but the dual SIM has its advantages because the cognition of the user is used for switching the network, which means that I am sharing the different networks depending upon whatever capacity is available, whatever rate plans are available. Now the question is, can we bring that cognition to the device? You don't have to do it, but the device will scan and then the device will hook onto the network, whatever is available with enough capacity at the specified rate plan. And that's cognitive radio, right? In fact, I really believe that Indian market is absolutely suitable for cognitive radio because you have 10 to 12 operators, operating with bits and pieces of frequencies which some, po some point of the other will get congested, somebody might have it, and so on. Uh, the only reason is that you know, it requires a modem which scans across from 450 megahertz all the way to 2.3 gigahertz and so on, so end devices are not still, um, are expensive, and therefore that may be, I mean, but I really think that is the way to go. Yeah, please. Yes. Yes. And also the the optical fiber that we have across India. Yeah. So um, the BWA access spectrum that is 2.3 gigahertz is being allocated uh, for the broadband wireless access. I mean, it's technology agnostic. You can use any technology to use uh, service in this particular spectrum. Uh, but uh, since the ecosystem exists for only TDLTE, so TDLTE is going to be the technology. Uh, which is going to be implemented on this 2.3 gigahertz. The, the only problem with 2.3 gigahertz is the high frequency, and therefore it requires, uh, it, it cannot work very well in uh, rural areas, suburban areas, unless you have multiples of base stations. And uh, indoor coverage is going to be very poor, whereas, so I really think that Mukesh Ambani is going to wait for 700 megahertz and then get that 700 megahertz, uh, because 700 megahertz is good uh, for indoor propagation. So this 2300 megahertz, uh, most likely it will be deployed only in the dense urban areas, uh, in buildings and things like that. Uh, does that answer your question? But it's quite a huge amount of frequency, 20 megahertz, so you can good, uh, provide good broadband and it is unpaired, so you can use it in a very optimal way. Uh, so it's a good uh, TDLT uh, ecosystem for uh, 2300 megahertz is good, and therefore it's going to be less expensive. I mean, it's not going to be very expensive, the de end devices and things like that. Optic fiber, uh, yes, we are building up to the rural uh, level, um, uh, panchayat level. Uh, the backbone is going to exist. I mean, BSNL is deploying it uh, from the funds from the Universal Service Obligation Fund. That's one of the mandates of the NTP 2012. So the backbone will exist, uh, but uh, the problem will still be with the access. Yes. Um, given the given the scramble for uh, spectrum yeah uh, and one of the points you mentioned that uh, the landline uh, is uh, dying a, a slow death correct uh, i was just thinking that uh, why not uh, you know see the land established uh, landline network hmm. as a uh, you know uh, uh, recognize its advantages also correct and uh, see it as a, a good complement to the mobile network. Absolutely. So that is happening. I think I have one slide. Uh, see, the characteristic of landline is that it works with economies of density. Right? For example, I lay a line today, the fixed line uh, will cost me about 15,000 rupees. Right? Whereas a mobile, on the other hand, costs barely 2,000 rupees. Right? 
that per GSM line connection cost is about $50 in India, right? It's about 20,000, 20, 25, 2,500 rupees. Whereas you put a landline, it's going to cost 15,000 rupees, right? So you will put a landline only if it is, if there is economies of density, right? You have a lot of people who want to use this, then I will put a fiber up to the curb and then give landline connection. And that's why if you see Airtel or any other landline providers, they will go only to the apartment buildings. They will never go to a place where you have an individual villa. You might have a villa worth crores, but you cannot get landline connection because that guy will say that it is not economical for me to provide you landline connection, right? So uh, economies of density works and economies of bundling works. What it means that uh, landline nobody uses for voice, so it has to be bundled with, for example, data connection, DSL. So if you go and ask a landline, private landline, not public, private landline provider, you give me, I'll just use it for voice, he will say that I will not give you, right? Because economies of density and economies of bundling works in Wi-Fi. So we have fiber, we have fiber up to the curb or fiber up to the building by the landline operators in dense urban areas, right? So in the dense urban areas, it is possible that you can use it as a complement network. How do I use it, right? In the dense urban areas are the areas which will get congested, right? So the government is giving you five megahertz, it will give you for the whole of Maharashtra, right? Not for Pune. But all the operators will put their network in Pune and say that my network has become congested, right? So the government will say that I have given it for the whole Maharashtra, go and do it in Nashik and other places and rural areas and so on, right? So the dense urban area normally gets congested very fast with the limited amount of spectrum. So what you can do is you might have a Wi-Fi network in some places, so you can offload the traffic. That's known as Wi-Fi offloading. Once you offload it, the Wi-Fi point is connected through the terrestrial DSL connection that uses the terrestrial DSL connection to connect to the internet. So the complementarity will happen once the operators see traffic on their network. Yeah. And in fact, you can do carrier Wi-Fi, which means that so normally it happens, right? We have a smartphone and you go into, I mean, you have set the smartphone to uh, use the Wi-Fi network. You go into a room uh, in your house, you have a Wi-Fi hotspot, I mean, Wi-Fi access adapter your uh, phone automatically uh, searches for that and then it sticks to that, right? But you have to provide authentication, right? You have to provide authentication. So now today, the 3GPP has evolved what is known as carrier Wi-Fi. So it is SIM-based authentication. So in the SIM, you can just roam through the Wi-Fi network. You don't have to authenticate. It will authenticate by itself. So that will be used as a complementary. So the wireline connection connected to that Wi-Fi hotspot will be used as complementary. Yeah. And they ran into a lot of this uh, congestion problems. Correct. At that time, they were actually encouraging their customers and giving free apps to use this Wi-Fi uh, phone. They're saying like, network is very congested, so if yeah. you're in your home, yeah. why don't you switch your That's phone? That's net neutrality. I'll come to that. IP. I'll come to that. Yeah. Okay. Plumber somewhere has a dual SIM or multi SIM. Why is it that the sub 5,000 rupees you find more phones with uh, multi SIM and the smartphones have single SIM? Uh, yeah, so that is related to the adoption behavior, right? So the adoption behavior of users like you and me are not to switch the network. You get a good quality network. I will pay whatever I want, but I want my applications and services to work. It's the reliability. Uh, you know, the cost is not the main, con one of the, I mean, it's, it matters, but not that much. Whereas when you compare it to the, uh, you know, sub 5,000, cost is one of the main considerations. And also they might uh, work in hard locations, right? They might go to a location where network congestion, uh, coverage itself is not there, right? In which they might have to make calls and therefore they might want to use that. Roaming charges. So those are all the considerations for the people in the sub 5,000. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so problem of the commons. So the problem of the commons, as economists say, is that you have a gra grassland, right? And then you allow all the cow owners to graze their cows. So first one or two cows, pretty much okay. All the villagers in the, cow, in the, in the village, all the villagers come there to graze their cows in that clearly defined, demarcated grassland. So what happens? It's quite possible that none of them get anything, right? And that is the problem of the commons. So if you make anything common, then everybody will start using it in the way in which they want. And finally, nobody will get anything, right? So that's the problem of the commons. And that is somehow related to net neutrality, right? So without congestion control mechanisms, 
the internet may be overgrazed. So you have the network, you have some capacity, finite. It is clearly demarcated, right? It's not infinite. And therefore, if you allow more and more people to use this, it's quite possible that it will be overgrazed, which means that none of them will get the required quality of service, required uh, uh, application services uh, over the internet. The important thing is when the cows graze, right? The cow which is grazing more does not know that it is causing a harmful interference for the other cow, right? It just grazes. Huh? So the same thing holds good. You might have a, you might have a smartphone and you might be downloading a BitTorrent movie, right? And you are not visualizing or even thinking that you are creating a social cost to the others, right? The other one may be just wanting to access this important email, right? But he's not able to get it because your BitTorrent is choking up the internet, right? Or the access pipe, right? So the village, the problem of the commons is very, very uh, evident in the case of um, uh, finite bandwidth, if you have finite capacity, and then if you don't have any kind of control over who graces what. So, um, so congestion problem uh, might still exist in the mobile broadband space. So we'll have to discuss that. Uh, so it is possible that you can use uh, different mechanisms for congestion control. I think Venki pointed out a number of technology options, right? So uh, it is possible that uh, I can uh, prioritize and then I can uh, do a lot of quality of service but depending upon the user needs. You know, for example, the user says that email is important for me, uh, push it fast, right? Uh, BitTorrent is not important for me, push it slow. So it's possible that you can set priorities depending upon the user's needs. Uh, the second thing is, um, yeah, so you use what is known as congestion pricing, right? So when the network is congested, you try to shift the traffic from that period to the other period. Right? We used to stay, we still remember, we used to stand in front of the PB, uh, what is it, PCO, which doesn't exist anymore, until, uh, you know, 9 o'clock in the night, right? I still remember. So at 9 o'clock, the rate would half. Why do they do that? It's congestion pricing. You, the network operator knows that there will, not, there will be less traffic during the night period, and therefore I will have uh, excess capacity, and capacity is perishable. You have to sell it, otherwise it's gone. I might as well sell it at half the price, right? And therefore, congestion pricing you can do in order to uh, smoothen the traffic, right? The traffic variations, the standard deviation of the traffic over a period of time, and then smoothen it, right? So you can do a lot of pricing schemes in order to control congestion problems. Uh, in fact, when the network is not congested, right? The marginal cost of transporting a packet is zero, and therefore you should sell it at zero price. You, must, you know, I wrote an article, what can you buy for one paisa? You could buy one paisa <laughs> for one paisa airtime sometime back. Today, it, it doesn't hold good because it's become 1.2 paisa, right? Now, when Tata Docomo or any of these new guys, when they launched the service, they said that you can get for 1 paisa airtime charge. You could not get anything else, but you can get, right? In fact, they should have priced it at zero. Why? Because they had created the network, they had the capacity, they had the frequency of 4.4 megahertz, right? But they didn't have anyone to use the network. They were starting to build the network, right? So the marginal cost, that is the cost of providing additional bandwidth to you and me, is zero. And the capacity is perishable, right? If I don't sell it now, it's gone. I might as well sell it at zero price, right? That's why one paise per minute came into being, right? And slowly over a period of time, when the network picks up, then the marginal cost increases. And that's why now you can't see one paise per <laughs> second anymore, right? The price has increased from 1.2 to 1.5 and so on, because the marginal cost is not anymore zero because the additional cost of carrying the capacity is higher. So the same thing holds good in the internet also. When the network has abundant capacity, right, you might as well sell it for zero, and you don't have to prioritize. I'll come to that later on. Only when the network is congested do all these problems exist. Right? So in the landline, we don't see any problem. In, the, in India, it doesn't exist. In the US or any other countries, the landline bandwidth is going up to gigabit per second, and therefore net neutrality debate doesn't arise, right? because you don't have a congestion problem. Uh, so, we'll come to that. So, any uh, questions on this tragedy of the commons problem? Right? So that's the economics of the network. So, we'll, we'll continue with the net neutrality. I'm not, I'm not asking the uh, remote locations. If you have any questions at this point of time, otherwise we can move. Okay. So, net neutrality debate. So, what is net neutrality debate? 
It's a principle that says that who operate network which provide an overall benefit to the public good and rely on public property should not use their ownership to confer discriminatory treatment. That's the most important statement here, right? So I should not discriminate between different applications, different services, different traffic uh, if I am providing this particular service. So no discrimination. That is, it prevents internet service providers from blocking, prioritizing any kind of traffic. Right? You should not, for example, block a particular network application or service because it is doing harmful to the network. It's being harmful to the network. Right? You cannot say, I will, fast, I will speed on you up. Right? Say in a, in, a, in a toll lane, you have uh, cars, all kinds of cars going. Right? Mercedes Benz goes, and then there is a Maruti 800 goes. Right? You cannot say that this highway is only for Mercedes Benz, and I will not allow Maruti 800. Right? Or you cannot say that, no, I'll have the specifically designed zones, roads for Mercedes, uh, Mercedes Benz, and uh, I have some, you know, very, uh, you know, Kachra Road. That's for your market. You cannot say that because everybody should be treated as equal, right? So that is the problem of discrimination. All bits are equal. So obviously, the proponents of this are the content providers, the application service providers, uh, and so on. The opponents are the bottleneck service providers. The bottleneck service providers may be a telco, the operator who provides mobile broadband, or it can be an internet service provider. For example, your case, you uh, talked about uh, RIL, which is providing broadband wireless access. It's not a telco. It's an ISP, right? Because that's the ISP license through which they got the spectrum. And they are internet service providers. They're not actually a telco, right? So an internet service provider or a telco, a mobile operator, uh, will oppose this particular view because of the congestion problems. <coughs> so examples, there are a lot of examples, right? Started in the US way back in 2005. And Madison uh, River Communication Broadband Service provider blocked 1H uh, internet telephony. So what happens is uh, this beautiful internet allows you to treat every bit as equal, right? And you cannot discriminate across the bits. So I can uh, do a voice over IP call, and it'll just go as an internet packet, right? And I can do a data, uh, you know, enterprise downloads or video download or data download. It'll also go as bits and pieces, right? But what this telco, which is the bottleneck operator, will do is that, OK, I will not allow voice over IP through my network. Right? I will allow all the other kinds of services. You can download data. You can see video. But I will not allow voice over IP. Why? Because if he allows voice over IP, everybody will be making voice over IP calls, which goes through the internet. And nobody will be making a public switched telephone network call. Right? A public switched telephone network call still costs right? cents, whatever it is. In India, it's about. You know, whatever it is, 1.5 rupees per minute, whatever it is, right? Whereas internet call can cost as low as 2 cents or 3 cents. A Skype call to anywhere in the world costs about 2 cents, right? So um, the, uh, the mobile operator can play these tricks, right? In order not to undermine my traditional voice business, I will discriminate against a voice over IP application. I will not allow that. Um, then there is, uh, in 2009 case, there is... Um, yeah, there is a, it's a very famous case, right, AT&T. So Skype developed uh, this voice over IP, which can work both on the Wi-Fi as well as the 3G network, right? Now, as you know, uh, iPhone was bundled. iPhone 2 was bundled along with the AT&T services. AT&T was selling the iPhone as a bundled service. So AT&T said that, asked iPhone, uh, the Apple, to remove the Wi-Fi over 3G from their iStore, OK? Only Wi-Fi over, I mean, sorry, voice over IP over Wi-Fi was allowed, right? Why? Because again, if they use voice over IP over the 3G network, it goes as packets, and you cannot charge much on the packets, right? People will start making calls over voice over IP application over their 3G network, and nobody will actually make a traditional phone call, which is going to earn revenue for the mobile operator, right? And therefore, it discriminated applications. It allowed voice over IP, two things, Wi-Fi over Wi-Fi over 3G allowed voice over uh, IP over Wi-Fi and disallowed voice over IP over uh, 3G. There is another important case. Um, uh, there is something called a Sling Media Player, which used to uh, which used to sell. I think still sells, right? The Sling Media Player is a device which you can have at home. One side you connect to the cable network, the other side you connect to the internet, right? So whatever comes on your TV through a broadcast network, such as cable TV network or a DTH, will get streamed over the internet by the Sling Media Player as a packet, right? 
Now on your mobile, you get an URL and you can actually see the streamed video. Whatever is being broadcast to your home, you can see it on your mobile, right? Only thing is, you know, there may be a slight delay because of the internet, thanks to internet. There's a time shift to TV, but in generally you can see, right? Now AT&T banned this on all the mobile phones, including uh, the Apple iPhone. Why? They said that this is cows overgrazing, right? This guy is downloading the streamed internet uh, broadcast and it is congesting my network. My, my network has only this much of capacity. So I'm not able to service all the, my other email users, for example. So it discriminated, it blocked, right? So this kind of a blocking is against net neutrality principle. And that's what the application providers won't like. Now, why won't they like? The application providers will say that I've created this beautiful, innovative application, right? Just because this operator is having a bot bottleneck monopoly, he is prohibiting me from using this, right? If everybody, you know, for example, in, in that case, Skype version, right, of voice over IP over 3G, nobody will be able to download, and therefore the application will be dead, right? So it curbs innovation, right? So the important thing is internet allows innovation at the edges. As an application programmer, I can create beautiful applications, right? But however, if the operator says that you cannot use it, then it kills my innovation. Hmm? The second one is consumer. Consumer wants to do it. Everybody, given... You know, I'm sure that if voice over IP is not very popular in India because of so many other reasons. But in general, you would like to use voice over IP for free, right? Because internet is free or almost free, right? Whereas if you want to use a traditional circuit switch telephone network, you will tend to pay more. And therefore, it is against the interest of the consumer, right? The mobile operator cannot say that you should use this and not use that, right? The third one is competition. So if you, uh, so I can say that mobile operator will can potentially say that, you know, I will only allow Google search, right? I will disallow all the other types of search engines, in which case it kills competition in the search space, right? So I cannot use, for example, Yahoo or whatever it is, right? So, it, so these are all strong <laughs> arguments uh, for net neutrality, right? That is not allowing discrimination of an application or service by the mobile operator. So there are three pillars of net neutrality. One is content prohibition. So you should not prohibit any content or application, right? So which means that you should not block and uh, uh, because it is against the, uh, against the innovation of application. The second one is access steering. Access steering, what it means is uh, prohibition against speedier delivery. I cannot prioritize, right? Certain type of application or content. What will happen, for example, Bharti Airtel, right? So Bharti Airtel might have uh, a tie up with Google. Right? So when you search Google, it'll be super fast, right? But when you search through Yahoo, it'll be, you know, it'll take its own time. Then over a period of time, what you will do is you will stop using Yahoo and you will switch to Google. Correct? So this is known as access steering. So access steering is possible. I can actually, as a mobile operator, mobile bottleneck operator, I can team up with a content or application provider. I can speed up. In fact, I, I lost bribe, you know, I lost more <laughs> money from you to speed up yours. But that's okay, right? All the others, I'll slow it down, right? The third one is vertical integration. So it is quite possible that the operator will buy out application, right? Or content provider. He will vertically integrate and then say that only my application will get this 256 Mbps or <laughs> 256 Kbps in our case. And the other guys will get only 10 Kbps, right? So it is possible that vertical integration can take place, right? So all these three will lead to, in the um, NetHeads view, lead to distorted competition, right? And therefore, we should not allow it. Is it clear? That's about proponents view. Uh, so for example, these kind of things do exist. For example, you get $29.99 and you get access to this, right? You want to access Yahoo, you have to pay $39.99. You want to access YouTube, you get $49.99. This is discriminatory pricing, right? Now, the question is, it is not prioritized, but it is discriminatory pricing. Now, it is quite possible that if there is discriminatory pricing, as a user, I might focus on only one application, right? I might just still want to do 29.99 and do that package instead of all the other things. And therefore, if they are of the same type, then some types are getting neglected, right? Same type of service. Okay. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, what the operators can do? So, the operators, normally what they do is, uh, Venki pointed out, uh, you can do label switching. So you can look at the, each label, each of the packet, and then do deep packet inspection, right? 
So depending upon, you know, you, and, you can even today, deep packet inspection can be done on all the seven layers, right? Even up to the application layer level. You can look at the URL and say that I block it, or you can look at the CRL and, URL and say that I can speed, it, speed you up or slow it down, right? So the deep packet inspection, inspection uh, can be used by the, uh, by the uh, mobile operator uh, to speed up or prioritize the services. <clears throat> now, so uh, in general, the net neutrality uh, proponents, what they really want is a ban on this. That is, content provider um, is given a certain priority. All the other things they are not worried about, right? If user wants to set the priority, it is okay. User wants to pay for the bandwidth, it's okay. Content provider wants to pay, pay for the bandwidth, it's perfectly okay. But content provider should not ask for priority, right? That's the only thing which the net neutrality opponents, uh, proponents want. Now, what do opponents want? Opponents want is that, of course, it is, you know, problem with the commons, right? So I don't have infinite field. I have only a limited amount of capacity, and more so in the case of mobile broadband, right? In the case of fixed line, it doesn't exist much, but in the case of mobile broadband, because of frequency limitations, I have only a fixed capacity, right? So prioritization of bandwidth is necessary for future innovations. So what they say is that if I don't prioritize, everybody will produce mediocre applications and services, right? If I prioritize, then everybody will try to compete with that prioritized application, and therefore they will improve on their applications and services to make it compete with that prioritized. And therefore, overall, the innovation capacity will go up, right? So that's the argument. <coughs> uh, so, uh, and the third important thing is, if I can't prioritize, and if my capacity is, you know, bottlenecked, then I will not have any incentive in order to increase my capacity, right? So you should have, you should allow me to do that, and therefore, you should allow me to charge and do whatever methods I want in order to uh, speed up or uh, prioritize the traffic. So, um, yeah, so these are problems. Um, so, I mean, let, let's just look back and look at the effect of prioritization. So, prioritization is the problem here, right? So, net neutrality is about prioritization. Now, prioritization makes sense only if you look at this particular graph, right? So, you have end user experience and then you have access speeds. Now, I have about 6 Mbps or about 100 Mbps. This is the curve. The lower part of the curve gives without priority the user experience, and the top one is with priority the user experience. So the user experience increases with priority, right? Because you speed up the packet, and therefore the response time is good, and therefore I'll be able to, uh, my experience will be better. But all these make sense only in this region, right? In this region, it doesn't make much sense. If you have high capacity on your network, it doesn't make much sense if you prioritize or non-prioritize, because the user experience is the same. Right? So if you have 100 Mbps or 1 gigabit per second coming onto your network, don't even think about priority. So that, that, uh, that concept doesn't hold good. Right? But if you have only megabits per second or kilobits per second, then you need to work on this prioritization because then it will make a difference to user experience. Right? So mobile networks, it becomes more important to discuss about prioritization compared to, for example, fixed line networks where abundant capacity exists. Right? So mobile is the key here. And uh, which operates in this typically in this particular region, more so here in uh, in India, right? So it is a very big problem. You know, soon uh, the operators will try to control what you see and then prioritize what you see. <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, I'll just uh, pass. I have about 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. So I'll pass for a minute. Uh, if you have any questions, otherwise I'll discuss this and then maybe the regulation policy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, why don't we have an operator who provides a data data plan to a particular home and then uh, he will provide a VOIP as well as a IPTV over that uh, data plan? I mean to say, uh, in that case, what will happen is uh, we, don't, we don't need a DTH from one service and then uh, I, I don't need a, a service provider for having um, uh, voice calls. That is perfectly fine. For example, if you look at most of the operators, they do that, right? You know, for example, most of the operators like uh, Tata or Airtel or whoever it is, they have Dish TV, they have landline, they have mobile. But right? they don't they don't sell over a uh, common package, right? Uh, it's possible. Uh, they do have, no, uh, I don't think, uh, because. Ah, so, so, I mean, that is, uh, you know, unless you, uh, you know, in, in economics, what is known as predatory pricing. You cannot say that you bundle all those things and sell below cost, right, to attract competition, to attract consumers. You cannot do that. As long as you don't do that, nobody prevents them from doing it. There is no regulation which says that you, in fact, Economics says that you have to bundle because only when bundling that both the operators as well as the user will get the maximum benefit out of it. 
So there is nothing which prevents them from bundling. Only thing is the market is disparate. I mean, it, the probability of finding a person who has fixed line mobile or dish TV, all the things from the same operator is less today. Yeah, right. That is one of the reasons. But if, if you have, then they can always give bundling plan. As long as they do not do predatory pricing. That is, they, they should not price it below cost like what Chinese do. So the net neutrality debate is uh, prioritizing in, say, let's say 3G, Correct. prioritizing data over voice or vice versa. Is that a debate? I have limited bandwidth and I have some uh, someone accessing data on Correct. a 3G card or Correct. on 3G phone Correct. and someone's trying to make a voice call. Right. So is that uh, something come that, that. that is not prioritized? That is, uh, that is not strictly net neutrality. I will come to that. That fair usage policy. I will come to that. Okay. So the important thing is why is it important in today's context with respect to smartphones and tablets? There is something called as two-sided markets. You know, previously we used to have phone just used to make calls, right? Calls to the others. But today, why are we having smartphone? In order to access application, right? Making phone, uh, making voice calls over a smartphone does not make much sense, right? You can might as well use uh, Nokia 100, uh, 1100 to do that, right? But you want a smartphone because you want to have access in applications. So, uh, what it says is that there is a platform, and then you have one user on this side, one user on this side. These are consumers, these are content or application providers. They have strong network effect, right? Network effect means that an increase in the content or application. Right? increases your propensity to use, right? increase in the number of users of particular application or content, increases the propensity of the developers to produce more an application. And this is known as cross-side network effect. Right? It is very predominant. Why do you want to use a Google smartphone? Because you can go to the Android marketplace, there are about 300,000 applications. Right? You want to use them. That is why you buy a Google phone. Right? Why a programmer wants to put something in the Android marketplace? He knows that there are about 500,000. Right? He wants to be that editor's choice, right? so that someone of that 600 million Android users will see that and download it. Right? So there is a strong network effect. Right? Replace this iStore or any kind of uh, store with an operator. Right? An operator here, there is a consumer, there is a content application provider. The platform, the operator provides bandwidth. That is of no use to the consumer in the case of broadband. Right? You can give me broadband, I can hack, uh, browse through some kind of an internet. After some time, I will get bored. Right? I want some compelling applications, right? which I can use in the broadband scenario. So, there has to be an alignment with content application providers. There are enough applications. Right? For example, if you look at RIL, their strategy is to provide a tablet kind of thing, provide educational content bundled, so that you have an application, you have a broadband, you will use that application in order to consume the bandwidth. Otherwise, people will not consume the bandwidth, right? So, there is a strong synergy between applications and content and broadband or capacity. You will waste the capacity. The operator will not be able to sell the capacity if the application or content is not there, especially in the case of mobile broadband, right? So, uh, so there is a tricky situation for operator, right? The operator has to promote content, but at the same time make sure that the capacity is sufficient, right? So, in all probability, if net neutrality regime is not there, he will vertically align and then push its own applications and prohibit other applications. So it's possible. So um, now, so content providers have been debating it, and they are not finding a uh, you know good situation. Oh, just one minute. So what they are doing is, like for example, Google, right? So tomorrow is the last day. <laughs> Any of you, you can even buy property in Kansas City and then get this Google. Connect, right? Because it seems that once you get Google Connect, your property value is going to shoot up like anything, right? So tomorrow is the last day for registration. If you register uh, for this uh, Google Fiber, you get seventy dollars a month for the uh, gigabit per second connection. So that bottleneck is removed, right? Who is removing the bottleneck? The content provider, not the up, not the operator, right? The operator is sitting quietly, Verizon or whoever it is, right? But the Google, which is the content provider, is solving this problem, right? Now you say otherwise. If you don't want, you can always pay three hundred dollars and then uh, everything is free, right? You free for, <laughs> free for a long time. So bandwidth is becoming almost free. Now operator just sits and watches, right? He says that Google is just doing it in one city, it won't work. It's not like a pan US operation, things like that, right? But uh, we'll have to see uh, how it goes. But you, Google is not just keeping things only in Kansas City, right? So if you look at it, they are partnered with five of the operators. One of the operators, Bharti Airtel, provide this unity consortium, which is uh, terabit per second uh, submarine fiber based uh, optic fiber network. 
which is touching most of the countries in Europe as well as the US. So they are building capacity. So the content providers, soon you will see that they will enter into the network game, right? Then they'll start providing capacity in whatever way they want. I really strongly feel that in the future, guys like Amazon, right? Amazon is one very important dark horse, right? You never thought that Amazon is going to compete with, for example, Apple. Today it is competing. It has the phone, it has the content, because you cannot sell a phone or tablet without any content. Amazon has all the content in the world, right? Their books, movies, whatever it is. So they have understood the two-sided markets, right? Only thing is capacity. <laughs> they use Wi-Fi most of the times, right? But today you will see that the 4G network, they, their new Kindle, uh, whatever, HD, they will operate on the 4G network, which means that they will use high capacity. They have, um, they have pioneered cloud computing so that you need not have store everything in your device, but you can access it over the cloud. So what is missing is the network. So I am assuming that in the future, Google will lay its own network or it will acquire any of the uh, mobile broadband service providers to provide end-to-end -end service, right? So this is the way in which the content providers have been approaching this uh, net neutrality problem. So I'll just finish it and then pass for a question. Regulatory and policy implications, very important, right? So should we allow net neutrality or not? Now, interestingly, you can either do ex-ante or ex-post, right? Ex-ante means I, the regulator will say that, okay, net neutrality is allowed, not allowed. Ex-post, like in India, we can look at the situation and then decide, right? So in, in the US, this is the regulator doing. Um, fixed and mobile broadband providers must disclose the terms and conditions, that's fine, transparency, no blocking. Fixed more broadband service providers as well as mobile uh, broadband service providers cannot block a particular application or a service, right? Blocking is prohibited. Whereas, if you look at, uh, yeah, so mobile, so mobile broadband is at an earlier stage in its development than fixed broadband. They say that uh, we prohibit providers from uh, blocking lawful websites and so on. And we conclude that it is appropriate to design to take measure steps in this particular area. So what they have done is blocking is not allowed for both fixed line as well as mobile service providers, but prioritizing is not allowed for fixed broadband providers but it is not applicable for mobile broadband service providers, right? So mobile broadband service providers still can prioritize their traffic. That's the FCC ruling, uh, which is till date, because they think that still spectrum is a constraint, and therefore the operator should be able to manage how they allocate capacity for different kinds of networks. The only country in the world which has uh, passed net neutrality regula regulation is uh, Netherlands. And you can guess why. <laughs> Netherlands is a very small country, right? And internet penetration in the Netherlands is the highest in the world. How? They are all fixed broadband, fixed wireline. Every home is connected to a fixed wireline. They have one GBPS running on each of the fixed line, so they can easily pass net neutrality regulation. Okay. India, no <laughs> wording about net neutrality in your national telecom policy of 2012, right? But it is more, all the more important for us, right? Because we don't have fixed line. We have mobile. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So uh, in India, it's all the more important, right? We don't have fixed line. We have only mobile, right? Mobile broadband access. And mobile broadband access capacity is very much limited. And therefore, you would expect that net neutrality regulation, either this way or that way, should come very much in India, right? So that is uh, the hope that uh, I and others will work on to persuade the government to see uh, whether it uh, can happen or not. The rest of the Europe is still languishing. Right? Because nobody can make a decision either ex ante uh, or ex post. So there are uh, you know, economists and technologists who vote for ex ante. There are groups which work for ex post, uh, but uh, the debate is divided. And uh, as usual, even the FCC has not made any concrete judgment on this net neutrality. They have partially, you know, basically the blocking, they have, uh, they have uh, put it in the net neutrality regulation for mobile service providers, but prioritizing is still open. Um, now, somebody asked the question about, uh, yeah, you asked the question about uh, prioritizing bandwidth. So we do have fair usage policy. How I many of you have read fair usage policy if you have, uh, uh, if you are a broadband user? It's a fair usage policy in small letters you have to read, right? So what is this? They have, I give you unlimited data plan, right? But it's not really unlimited. I mean, you say that uh, I'll, I'll give you a 2 Mbps unlimited data plan, but what the plan will do is after you hit about 5 gigabits, right? your uh, draw, speed will be dropped to about 256 kilobits per second. And then you use it for 10 gigabyte, 
After 10 gigabyte, you might not get it, right? That's the fair usage policy. Now, the question you are asking is, is it net neutrality? Is it against net neutrality, right? That's the question. Now, the, 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 the important thing is, it doesn't discriminate between applications, but it discriminates between users, right? So, I may be a very uh, avid user of net to BitTorrent, okay? I will reach that limit immediately, right? Then I will stop. I cannot use BitTorrent anymore because I have hit that bottleneck. So I will not use BitTorrent anymore, which means that it is a discrimination against application. So indirectly, it is a discrimination against the application, right? So um, now the question is whether you should allow it or not, right? I mean, given the spectrum capacity, I think, in my opinion, we should adopt the same rules as FCC. And once we have enough capacity, then we can move towards the true net neutrality uh, regime uh, for prioritizing. But blocking should definitely not be allowed. So uh, be very careful when you sign up for this unlimited data plans, right? <laughs> because there are a lot of the fair usage policy issues. So discrimination, discrimination against users might indirectly discriminate against particular applications. So for example, an Indian entrepreneur in uh, you know, Pune comes up with a beautiful application for uh, video streaming, right? But this video streaming consumes a lot of bandwidth. I'm using it, but I'm not able to use it because of fair usage policy. So I might decide not to use it, and my word of mouth spreads, and the whole application dies, right? So which is discrimination against application. OK, that's it. So any uh, specific questions for this? I think I'm. Any questions? Yeah, please. So, for this common term use, uh, usage problem, yeah. uh, is it that the idea of it is data free given to a consumer the best way to solve it? Of giving a fixed data plan. Let, let's say if there's a user, he wants a 512 kbps plan, and there's a user who wants a 3 Absolutely. You are, you so are, we got that, you got the nail in the wall, correct. So there is problem. nothing like unlimited data plan, OK? So what I will do is I'll give you a limited 2 Mbps up to uh, two, uh, 5 gigabytes, you will pay x, OK? You can still continue to use beyond 5, right? But your rate will be x plus y, which is y is steep, OK? So I can use discriminatory pricing depending upon the amount of downloads. Yes, that is not uh, discriminatory between applications. That is not discriminatory. So, it's not discriminatory correct. between the type of content. Correct. The, the, the responsibility will rest with the end user. Correct. It's not the responsibility of the content provider. In Absolutely. Case, nor the application. Case. Absolutely. So isn't this the best yes, way? Yes, that is the best way to go. Why you can ask this question? This seems to be like a very simple problem to solve, right? You have solved this problem. Why did it not happen? The important thing is, then rest of the world, forget about India, because one India just now mobile broadband is picking up. In rest of the world, the fixed line was always an alternative for mobile, right? Fixed line was, is always there. Most of the advanced countries, fixed line is always there, right? And the fixed line have enough capacity. And therefore, there is always a flat rate plan in fixed line service, OK? Now, you say that mobile will be not flat rate, but it will be tiered, like what you have mentioned, stepwise, right? Nobody will buy mobile broadband. They will again go to the home and then download the video. So most of the countries, because of this limitation, have forced fixed uh, unlimited data plans in mobile. Now they are feeling the pinch. Okay, so that's the reason why, for example, the simple solution did not occur in the rest of the market. This tiered building, huh? but in India, tiered building is the best way to go. You are absolutely correct. Then I don't discriminate against application. It's up to the end user. If you want to use more than five gigabytes and you want, you have the capacity to pay. You pay for that and then use it. Right. So there is nothing like unlimited data plan. This unlimited data plan will go away soon. Yeah. Um, in India, we have uh, you know tremendous shortages of uh, fuel, transportation, uh, you know, uh, parking, uh, road space, uh, uh, this and that. So, um, and our economy is greatly dictated by, uh, you know, import of fuel uh, in various direct and indirect ways. So, I think that one reason why, uh, say, uh, video conferencing is not being uh, uh, kind of uh, 
absor adopted and absorbed uh, is uh, both at the user end as well as at the government uh, end. And uh, you know, mobile uh, uh, telephony operators can really play that liaison, uh, uh, liaisoning uh, role and bring about this cultural shift to allow uh, remote working it's by selling that idea. Correct, correct. So, so uh, yeah, I have happening? done some work. I mean, this, uh, you know, like uh, commuting, right? Telecommuting. It's called telecommuting, using video conference and things like that. Some companies who have global presence, uh, global practice have uh, started doing that. Uh, but uh, that is definitely we should, uh, you know, now that we have the infrastructure, uh, we should uh, use that because uh, telecommuting seems to be sort of a replacement for face-to-face -face communication. Instead of investing in bridges Correct. and fuel, Possible. invest in Possible. this. Possible. So last question. Yeah. And then uh, these are uh, some of the papers. You can Google it and then you can take it. Yes, last one. the telecom operator because it's uh, it seems the uh, uh, tussle between android and uh, rim or android and apple uh, is somewhere the telecom operator sidelined in this uh, entire debate because it's the application that is really uh, absolutely you are correct so uh, see what normally happens is that unless you bundle the operator bundles he doesn't have any association with the handset okay now for all you know the uh, the the platform provider like apple or so it is might bundle it uh, on a, some specific period of time with the operator, so the operator can have control. But now that we are moving slowly towards uh, you know, more platforms, like Windows 8 is coming up, Android and so on, and then Android is anyway open system, you can always use any. So the operator bundling is seemed to have uh, taken a back seat. And that's why the operator is sort of excluded in this debate. I'll close this. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Shridhar for giving a great insightful talk. I'll request Anand to give him a small memento. Dr. Shridhar, please stay. And thanks very much to Persistent for inviting me, and thanks to Dr. Venkatesha. It has been really a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks all.